One of the most popular episodes of the Art Class Curator podcast so far is number 15, Play-Based Art Education with Dr. George Sakelli. Today, I interview his daughter, Dr. Ilona Sakelli. After growing up with such a creative and thoughtful father, it's no wonder that Ilona is a delightful and insightful woman. I'm thrilled she's here to share her observations and ideas with us. Hello, this is Cindy Ingram, and welcome to the Art Class Curator Podcast. We're taking art out of the dark with thoughtful explorations and in-depth interviews designed to ignite curiosity and delight and passion in art classrooms everywhere. I'm thrilled she's here to share her observations and ideas with us. I am so excited to welcome Ilona Sakelli to the podcast. Welcome, Ilona. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. So you might recognize listeners, her last name. We had her dad on the podcast uh, just a couple months ago, Dr. George Sakelli, and he talked with us all about play in art education. And he recommended I interview you because you have a new book coming out and you have a lot of great art and research. So I'm excited to, to talk with you today. Thank you. He's my best promoter, I think. So. Yeah. <laughs> he oh, he emailed me right? several times. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> he emailed me once. <laughs> yeah. That was my mom and other people didn't. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So tell us a little bit more about your background and your experiences. Okay. Um, let's see. I was born in Brooklyn. I uh, just lived there for a few years. And then I uh, grew up in Kentucky, um, really in my, in my father's studio, as you can imagine. Um, I went to UK for my undergraduate. I wasn't really sure if I wanted to. I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I wasn't really sure about the art part. I play music. I was a violinist from age three to, to 18. At that point, I, I made the decision that I didn't want to didn't want to do that anymore and switched uh, fully to art. I didn't have too much of an art background other than my being in my father's studio and being in his classes. Um, and I had some in high school, of course. Um, then I moved to, um, well, I taught for a couple of years in Northern Kentucky and then I moved to New York to get my master's um, at Teachers College Columbia, which was a wonderful experience. I worked with Judith Burchett and Graham Sullivan and uh, in my mind, a lot of the, a lot of the greats in our fields. <laughs> Um, I felt very privileged uh, for that experience. I love New York. That's where uh, my heart is. My sister's there. I'm a lot of family there. Uh, but at that point, it was 9-11, and I had to get out of the city, so we moved to D.C., because that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the second safest place. <laughs> uh, so I moved to D.C., and I taught their elementary school um, in Arlington, Virginia, which was a wonderful experience. They are so supportive of the arts. Um, and really, except for the exorbitant house prices and all of that, I would have loved to to stay there. It's just a very expensive uh, place, yeah. but an amazing school system. Um, and I just had my daughter, so we decided to move back to Kentucky. I taught uh, here for a year in middle school before I decided to go back to school for my PhD in educational policy. So I have two degrees in art ed, one in educational policy. I feel like it balances each other out. <laughs> rather nicely so and um i've been teaching at eku which is about a half an hour outside of lexington for the past 10 years um i thought i would stay here for like a year after my phd and i just kind of i love it it's really a great place so i've um i've stayed and i'm currently the president of the kentucky art education association so we just had a conference last weekend (laughs) oh you're tired i bet right now (laughs) Well, tired today's fall break which is i'm very thankful for but um yeah it's kind of been kind of crazy so yeah, yeah. so you've done a little bit of everything do you have a favorite um grade level to teach I would definitely say like third or fourth grade um yeah. but this is definitely my favorite I was not a middle school teacher um it's just I don't have that sense of humor I think to be a middle school uh, teacher. I loved it on some levels but at the same time um I think my my favorite is that kind of third and fourth grade uh, where they're still so excited about art and they can get a lot um, across and there are too. So have great yeah. conversations. I love, I just love how different I've taught all the grade levels too. And it's just so fun. Like every, they're all so different and they all have their pros and cons. I love middle school is my favorite. I'm like, I love those little squirrely. <laughs> <laughs> like they're just so weird. No, well, awesome. One of the things I always tell my students, <laughs> depends on your experience, right? If you had a really, if you're in a really good school that you like, yeah. then it can be a great experience in middle school or, you know, any, any grade. But if you're not in a school that works with you, 
um, that can also be a problem. So part of it is finding your, your right spot. Yeah, that's a really important point, especially for the new teachers out there, that if you're, it's your first year and you're having a terrible time, know that all schools are not the same. Uh, and just like you, you said you were going to stay for a year, you found your place, you know, and you've been there 10 years. So it's all about finding your place and, and uh, it's okay to. Interviewing them okay. like they're, interviewing, they're interviewing you. And that I think is, you know, you want a job yeah. so badly. Um, that's all you can think about. But I think it's important to understand that you're also, you know, you're interviewing them. And if you get a feeling that it's not the right fit, you know, there are other schools available especially yeah. in the climate right now. So it's a, it's a good time to be in Kentucky and look for, for our teaching job. Oh, is it? <laughs> Everyone moved to Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> you've, got, you've got the Sakelli duo there. So that would, mm-hmm. that would be an amazing place to go. Um, so I understand you have a book in the works about art and design in the community. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, what you're working on? Yeah. Um, well, for my PhD, I was looking at museums. And I was really interested in teens and in museums. And I was coming from New York and D.C., where, as you know, museums are very prominent, right? Um, And I came to Eastern Kentucky, where we really don't have a lot of, um, really any, uh, museums or uh, too many gallery experiences. So I really shifted my focus to using the community um, as an important visual resource for my students and started to think a little bit beyond that museum experience. Um, and couched a little differently. I would I started to take my students to uh, places like Walmart and Myers, right, and talk about the um, kind of the, some of the beautiful visual things that we see in these stores. And these are places our students go every day. So it's important to understand that this too is a visual experience, right? We make choices when we go there. Um, you know, what kind of lunchbox we're going to get? There's like 500 choices, or what kind of water tumbler we're going to get? Again, probably a thousand choices. Uh, but these are all design choices, and we give a lot of these choices, hopefully, to our students uh, to make these choices. So going from something like that even to going, taking walks downtown and looking at some of the architecture um, in bigger cities, looking at subways or, um, you know, parks, things like that. So to really think more of the outside world as kind of our um, a place to, to see things and not only going into museums and, and galleries, which I... Um, I think it's important too. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, that's part of the part of the discussion of the book, I should say. Yeah, that's really fascinating because you know when I when I saw art and design in the community, I was thinking of murals and public sculpture and stuff like that. But uh, going into Walmart and looking at all the lunch boxes, that is so good because you know they're and you could even compare different stores, you know, and like how the quality or like what, what design people gravitate to and the, how cool is that? I love it. Well, so, you think back to when you were a kid, when you think back to when you were a kid and you decided which um, cereal to buy, for example, right? You didn't actually choose that based on the flavor of the cereal. It was generally the design of the box or for, for me, maybe the toy inside because <laughs> I am that old, but um, yeah, it's something to think about in terms of those choices that we that we make. And we do go into murals. I will go into murals and all those other public artworks, but right. that's part of, that's just basically a chapter of the larger story. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because, you know, the, the kids, and I, I've probably said this a thousand times on the podcast already, always seems to come up, but our, you know, our kids are just bombarded with images and, and this is such a great way to help them discern, um, the world around them, you know, and how to, how to understand what, what's going on and how they're being manipulated and how they're, and, and, and also how to find delight in, um, in the world too, which is awesome. Yeah, and in the everyday. I mean, I have my students all the time. I do things like take a Starbucks cup and put it on the pedestal, right? The all important pedestal. Okay. How can we look at this as a work of art? Um, so all of those things, and then we can translate that using those same, you know, terminology and everything, all the, um, art speak, you know, into other, other artwork, but you know, you can start with very simple things. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. So how do you integrate that sort of discussion into your art making in the classroom? Into my classroom? Like studio art. Like what are the kids um, in relationship to them? Well, we do a lot of 3D things um, and then kind of translate it to 2D. And I find that a lot of often when I talk to students about their own art experience, they didn't get a lot of um, 3D. So I think it's important to do the 3D also because the kids are um, 
are at home doing a lot of 3D, right? Whether they're playing with blocks or playing with different toys. Um, and I think using that first and then translating it into the 2D can be really important. So kind of having that relationship where we're not just doing things like still lives with objects that I think are important, uh, but actually taking some of the things that they think are important and then um, having them manipulate play and uh, take those things to the to the 2D and maybe back again. So um, that's some of the things, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point that, that we sort of start at 2D. I never really thought about it that way. But I was uh, leading my daughter's Girl Scout meeting this past weekend. Mm -hmm. Well, technically she was leading it. It's girl-led meetings this year. So no. I was... Uh, but the, the, the badge was drawing the drawing badge. And um, so my daughter had to lead an activity of drawing a still life and adding shading to it because that was part of the requirements of the badge. And I noticed that the, they were drawing these, the pumpkins, those little pumpkins you get um, at Halloween and how really challenging it is to, to draw like the stem kind of in the middle of the circle instead of right on top. And it was fun to watch which kids drew, they're all in fourth grade, which kids drew the top and which kids drew it in the middle. And, and I, and I'm thinking, you know, if they start with 3d, that maybe that some, some of those spatial observations can be, can be started with 3d. Absolutely. I and mean, even with a pumpkin, if you, they're actually holding the pumpkin in their yeah. hand, right. And feeling where the stem is. Um, yeah. And like, other parts like those discussions can be really important you know same thing with the face I mean if you're actually feeling your face and understanding where your nose is compared to your eyes I mean the actual touch can be important and doing it then in clay and then transferring it over I think can be can be um, more beneficial but that's just <laughs> yeah <laughs> like so this is a good segue into your own art because I was looking at your website and uh, you have a lot of your artworks up there, and we'll link to it in the show notes. So can you tell us about the art that you make and the materials you like to use? Um, I also do a lot of drawing and three-dimensional. I think I also like the, the drawing aspect, so I think I incorporate that a little bit into, into what I do um, going back and forth. Um, I definitely like to use a lot of um, found objects. And a lot of personal objects. I think the personal to me is very important. Um, I definitely translate that to things I do with my students. Um, I talk to them all the time about incorporating the narrative and the personal into their work. And I, I, um, I do the same with my work for sure. Um, and I, I think um, different experiences that I've had um, shape the work that at different places I am in my life definitely shape the work that I'm doing. Um, the latest work <laughs> I've been working on are a kind of um, bra and panty series um, <laughs> of work. And a lot of that really came from um, my daughter. She's going to kill me for this. Um, <laughs> my daughter, she was growing older and she was, um, you know, becoming a woman and dealing with a lot of the issues of, you know, getting breasts and all of that. I don't know if we could say that on here. Um, but I'll, I'll go yeah. for it. Sure. <laughs> you know, it, yeah, I just, just all of those um, those things that the bra kind of holds in it, right? You know, issues of sexuality and empowerment or repression, um, uh, feeling like you're strapped in, right? All of those things. So I kind of took things that were part of our world at the moment um, and were very important to, to her as she was growing and developing and um, kind of thought a little bit also about my own um, experiences growing up as well. And have translated that into a series of work. And I, I do that, it's generally what I'm doing is wherever I'm at um, in my life, I kind of translate that a little bit to, to my artwork. So there's a lot of things with um, uh, women's issues just because that's who I am. A lot of things about education. I have a whole series I did um, called School, basically, and it's um, dealing with um, testing. Mm. Yeah, I saw some of those. Yes, <laughs> which is another uh, thing that has definitely, you know, I, I sent uh, my daughter to a Montessori school and part of that was because of, you know, I felt like she was being overly tested um, within even kindergarten before she decided to go to Montessori or I decided for her to go to Montessori. Um, you know, within the first couple of uh, weeks, she was tested four or five times for a kindergartner and I, I pulled her out of that uh, that school. But also, you know, thinking about arts testing, which is something we had for many years in Kentucky. Um, so here in Dallas, 
Dallas, I yeah. see that. <laughs> Florida, Florida has it probably the worst, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had, uh, we had some interesting, um, <laughs> things with testing for sure. <laughs> I can go into a whole thing with that, but I won't. Um, but yeah, so just kind of reflecting on that a little bit, um, as I, I mean, I have lots of stories I could probably talk about. Those are just a few of them. So, yeah, I like how you're, you know, you're taking issues that you're, you're grappling with in your own personal life and using your art as a way to personally move through them, but also to um, make a statement and to change the world in a way too. You know, you're, you're communicating this. So I love that um, mix of the personal and the social yeah. issues and that sort of thing. A lot of teachers have a hard time once they start teaching, balancing being artists and educators. And a lot of art teachers just stop making art altogether, if you, except for like making posters at their school. So how do you balance both being an educator and an artist? Um, I won't lie, it's a constant battle. And I think it is for all of us, especially if you start having kids and other things going on. Um, my first few years teaching, I didn't have my daughter and I made art every day when I came home and I was, you know, I was gung ho and very active and it does get harder um, as time goes on, as you can imagine. I have a book going on, like all kinds of stuff. Um, partially for me, it's having a space. I always have a space so I know when I do have time, I don't have to set up. And I think that's really important because if I took hours to set up, um, it would kind of sidetrack me or I'd be like, oh, I have all this time I have to set up. Why would I bother um, doing that? So I think, um, it's not a huge space, but it's a good space to, to always go in. And even if I'm working for 15, 20 minutes, I'm doing something. Um, and doing that continually is important. Because as you know, going back, if you haven't done it for a long time, is probably the worst part. Um, it's kind of like going to the gym, right? <laughs> you have to exercise those muscles. And if you don't exercise them, you know, it's, you know everything you're going to do in the very beginning, you know, if you haven't done it for a while, is not going to look great. And you have to kind of be okay with that. You know, it's like throwing on the wheel. Your first few pots are not going to look great. You have to get to number 50 or 100 before it looks okay. And it's that same thing. I think we forget that sometimes, right? That is practice. Um, and it takes time. Which I think is very, very important for teachers to still be artists. I mean, that's what we're modeling for our, for our students. And that's really um, first and foremost. And even if we're an artist for 20 minutes a day, we're still doing something. And I think that's um, more than, yes, making posters, as you said, or making samples um, or all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, being, if we're, if we're going to teach our kids that to keep trying and that to, to make their art better than each practice and all of that, then we need you know, to do that ourselves. I think I could take that lesson lesson myself. I used to have a space in my house, in my old house, but then children uh, took those spaces and filled them with toys. So, do that. <laughs> <laughs> although I do have an office now, but it's uh, Art Class Curator Central. So, it's there you go. Well, one of the things I did is I actually, when I created my space, I did very much what my dad did is actually create a space for my daughter uh, to work with me. Um, and I think that's, that's a little bit of a key when you're um, a parent, because you're not going to have so much time to just shut yourself in the room, right, and, and do, make art. But, you know, she would nicely work beside me. And I did the same uh, when I was a kid. So I think that that's important to um, to use it as kind of a relationship builder on some level. That too. is so good. Because I do have a space for my kids. It's the art table. And they have all their art supplies. So I always wanted them to, you know, always be able to make anything whenever they want. It drives my husband crazy because there's paper everywhere all the time. I don't know. Yesterday they're cutting up sponges. So there's you know, pieces of sponges all over the floor. But I like that that space is always available to them. And I need to, I need to bring myself a chair and, and add it to their art table. And Yeah, you know, put a little table next to it or something. You know, I mean, I think it's important. To, you're modeling too. I mean, you are. You're modeling that art. Um, and it's a call to action to me to do that. And so hopefully you, you've called other people to action too. I'm going to do that. <laughs> you've made a difference on me. I love that. I'm lost in my head. I'm like, oh, how am I going to do this? Well, and too, when you're a parent, this is getting off topic, but when you're a parent, sometimes you don't want to play Wii Party or whatever they want to play because you're an adult and you don't like to play with toys, but you get to still spend time with your kid doing both doing something enjoyable that you like. And exactly. yeah. You know, and they could be building with Legos, but you might be, you know, 
drawing the Legos themselves or, and then, you know, they'll kind of catch on to that. So I love that. Um, so that. I've noticed in your art and in a lot of what we're talking about, I see a lot of the influence of play in your art. And I know uh, your father talks all about play. So how, um, how much did your father impact the type of artist that you've become? Um, I, I can't imagine that he didn't in several ways. <laughs> As I said, I grew up in a studio doing what we were just talking about, having those um, conversations as we worked together. Uh, so that's definitely part of it. Also, he would um, <laughs> do something really wonderful, I think, is that, and I was a Montessori child too, so he would take me out of school um, I know it's so taboo. <laughs> class, and sometimes he would allow me to actually lead the class and tell them about the art I was making at home. So I became a teacher at a very young age. I'm sure, oh. that didn't now. <laughs> <Can't imagine. laughs> and uh, then he would take me across the street to the university uh, museum, and we would talk about art, uh, the art that was there, and then we'd go to lunch. So we had some great, uh, great experiences, kind of skipping school. But the idea being that you're learning. Um, in other ways, right? That that's not your only ex learning experience. So he definitely um, influenced me in that way. He also um, allowed me and encouraged me to play. And I think that's important. Um, he was always um, just interested in anything we were playing in and kind of, you know, using that in his class and saying, oh, that's a great idea. I'll use it in my class, even if <laughs> it didn't always use it. But, you know, that idea of kind of heightening it to another level and validating what you're doing, right? I think it's really important, right? If you say to a kid, I'll take a picture of that. Um, that definitely validates them in terms of, oh, yeah. this must be really amazing thing that I did because you took a picture of this. Um, and it's that same idea of just kind of validating, um, validating that. And you had mentioned something about, you know, the materials I use and stuff. I think um, it's just that idea of experimentation that kept going, right? Because I was allowed to say, okay, maybe I'll use the wheels of this truck, you know, to actually, um, you know, print with. And, you know, nobody stopped me. It wasn't, you know, and that, that's part of it is that nobody's saying, oh, no, you can't do that, you know, and that's, why can't I do that, you know? <laughs> so we were allowed to do those things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, influences every part of you at that point, right? Uh, I love that. And, and that's, it's so interesting. Now, I will put pictures or link to your website on the show notes but for those of you that are just listening right now. Yeah, you use a lot of, I know, notice like bits of toys and a lot of found object sculptures and a mix of print and, um, and objects and placed together in interesting ways. And the whole time I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is exactly what George Zicchelli was talking about on his podcast. And I just thought it was so cool to see how that that sort of upbringing and that sort of um, delightfulness that is your dad, that it became this amazing, you know, led to you. And now you're doing that for everybody else. And I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, even some of the more serious issues that I do try to tackle in my heart, my art, one of them being, um, you know, issues of, um, you know, I getting a hysterectomy and I made all these pillows kind of based on that for my grandmother's, um, you know, old, old night shirts and stuff. Uh, but even that I think keeps that play element in there, which is, you know, always interesting. So definitely. So one of the issues that you have written a lot about, and I've, I read some of your articles on your website, and that is about body image in the art room. And this is a, an issue that I'm particularly um, it's one of my hot button issues that I'm passionate about. So uh, what are our students facing in regards to body image and why is this such an important topic to address? Um, I think it's an important topic because it's something that they're dealing with. And if it's something they're dealing with, I think we have to um, reflect on it in some ways. I've definitely, I have written about it. I feel like it reflects more my art now than it definitely does in my writing. Um, but it is very important. And I've, I, things like self-portraits, for example, I always find interesting. You know, our students are constantly reflecting on themselves. You know, uh, my daughter just started high school, but she was a middle schooler, right? And she was, um, you know, this constant analyzing who you are in the mirror, right, is really, um, is really difficult, right? Nothing looks good. Everything's wrong. Um, 
And so I, you know, one of the things I always tell my pre-service students is, look, you know, maybe doing a direct self-portrait in middle school is not the best idea. That's all they're doing is overanalyzing themselves. Maybe having them do portraits of their friends when they're going to, you know, be analyzing each other is not such a good idea. Are there other ways to get at who we are and reflect on who we are? I mean, we're in the age of selfies, so they're constantly taking selfies anyway. Um, So using those selfies even might be good. Um, It's kind of a starting point, but you know, when do we introduce something like the self-portrait? Is that really the best time to do it? So I think, you know, also timing, also thinking more about being, um, you know, introspective introspective in terms of our own uh, body, our own ideas of beauty uh, can be really important. Introducing artists like Barbara Kruger, um, you know, who deals a lot with um, body issues can be, uh, can be important. And, you know, a lot of that is timing, you know, do do you want to do that in sixth grade? I don't know, but it might be better for, you know, a ninth or 10th grader who's more mature and can handle some of those things. Um, I always find middle school to be those ages where you're, you're really dealing with it head on. Right. So sometimes you don't want to reflect on it in that way. Um, it's too, too difficult to do it at that point and finding ways around it instead can be, can be important. So. Yeah, I think a lot of teachers do, you know, self-portraits are just a natural first project. And even I did it as a first project when I was teaching middle school. And then someone I heard, I don't know, it was on Facebook or somewhere, someone said, oh, I never do self-portraits so early in the year because, you know, it's such a vulnerable thing for the students. And I was like, I had never (laughs) thought about it that way, but you're so right. That uh, it really is like that's all they're concerned. That's their the way they're perceived in the world and who they are as a person. Like there, it's all up in the air at that point when they're in middle school. So, um, I think finding ways to help them be comfortable and positive in their skin, and also understand their worth as a person, uh, doesn't depend on what they look like. Um, all of those things I think are so important to address, and not just what you physically look like. Yeah. Yeah. It's just such an age of over analyzing that it's, you know, every hair in your head, every little pimple, everything is an issue. Mm-hmm. And then we see it, your drawing of it, which is, you know, usually not a hundred percent accurate representation anyway. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It can sometimes be more painful than anything else, right? Do I really look like that? You know, do I want to look like that? All of these questions kind of come up um, with those things that I don't know if we really want to address at that age because it's a larger, a larger issue than uh, their drawing ability. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can teach them to draw. If you want to really teach them facial proportions, they can they can draw anything else. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And I think drawing their friend too, like you said, that's not a good idea. And I'm like, yeah, that really wouldn't be a good idea because then that you're adding all sorts of social dynamics in there. That's it's already drama enough. Exactly. <laughs> oh, so dramatic. Um, someone would cry. I'm sure someone would cry. Oh, inevitably, yes. <laughs> at least, at least once per class period. <laughs> that one. Oh, yeah. So. So how do you have any suggestions on how we can address this in the classroom, like tactically or like in a, in a lesson or um, besides just having conversations about it and choosing your lessons around it or to avoid certain issues? Um, yeah, I think definitely avoiding the certain issues are important. And I think also adding um, lessons that are a little bit more personal. And I think that's something I, don't see enough of I feel like going around to schools um, that it is more of exercises in art um, and not a lot of the personal um, and I think that's really important to start thinking about um, how we can add narrative and um, a little bit about who the student actually is in the artwork right I mean when we make art um, you know as adults a lot of us are, are doing that I would say a good percentage at least have something um, something personal, um, some sort of narrative in their art. And yet we're not thinking that's important with our students. And it is very important. They have a story to tell. Even at the youngest age, they have a story to tell. Um, so I, I think part of that is um, not saying let's do one lesson on body image, uh, but instead right. allowing for um, you know them to use their art as kind of a, a discussion um, and 
look into themselves a little bit deeper. So, mm-hmm. so then, how would you balance um, teaching the skills of art uh, with the personal stuff? Like how how do you how do you do both? Um, I always find that interesting because I do have students who ask me that, well, how do we introduce the elements and principles or how do we introduce certain skills? And, you know, you know, the elements and principles is our language. First of all, it's not a lesson. Um, when a mm-hmm. student says to me, I'm doing a lesson on a uh, line. I'm like, okay, so what's your lesson? Like, it's great, but you know, when we, when we do the work, it can have line in it. We can discuss line. We can talk about line. It's like when Emily was little, I said her name, that's okay. Um, <laughs> my, daughter, <laughs> my daughter was little, um, you know, I take her to the store and she would uh, touch the clothing, right? And we would talk about things like texture and line and color and all these things, um, just like we would if we were talking about a work of art. And I think we forget sometimes that we don't, you know, do a Picasso, right? Uh, Picasso's already done Picasso. He did it really well. Um, so, you know, teaching them actual things about being an artist, teaching them things that are personal. Um, and you can, you can use all of your vocabulary in that. Um, you can use all of your skills in that, right? Um, for example, one of my favorite lessons with middle school is they did um, – their, what they would want their future bedroom to look like, right? If they could have, you know, any kind of bedroom in the world, what would it look like? Well, that's very personal. It's a personal space that we're creating, right? And we, we you know, stu- kids love to actually design their own bedrooms. They don't have, you know, um, you know, a pool in their bedroom. But thinking about the, um, the excitement of doing that, you can teach perspective through that, right? You know, you can teach how to design a room. You can teach how to do a bed, all of those things through that lesson and yet you still are adding that personal element. And I think that's, that's kind of that connection. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, that I'd like them to have. Yeah. I, the whole doing the whole curriculum centered around the elements and principles just drives me crazy too. Uh, Because I think we, a lot of our teachers will use it as a crutch that, you know, this is our content. This is, this is how we will, this is how we validate ourselves to other art, other teachers that see we do have real content. Look, it's implied line. It's a thing. We can test it, <laughs> but we don't need to do that because art doesn't need to be like math. Art can be just about art. Yeah. And it's a language. I'm not saying we shouldn't use it, but it really yes. is a vocabulary. We want kids to actually speak it um, mm-hmm. and not write it down or do a lesson on it. And that's, that's as far as they get. I mean, that's just, well, it's boring if nothing else. I mean, I've had teachers call me at the beginning of the year. Well, why is this, why are the kids, you know, misbehaving? Why? And so, okay, what's your first lesson? Well, I'm doing, you know, the elements, um, you know, different lessons on the elements. I'm like, well, maybe that's the problem. You know, they're in middle school and you're still doing lessons on the elements um, when, you know, it should be incorporated into what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, I <laughs> I could go on and on about this. I know, I love it. It's my favorite topic. It's actually the, um, well, one of my favorites is my, the, the biggest, uh, like if you looked at my stats on my website, mm-hmm. um, the people that come the most frequently or like they come in via my Elements of Principles posts. And so wow. if you're one of those people and you somehow are listening to this podcast now, uh, I have a plan that I'm trying to convert you to not do that, but I'm bringing you in with that because that's what you're Googling. <laughs> we, have all, we have it all mapped out. Uh, we're going to do a whole email series on it. But uh, I really do, like, I know that, I know it's important and we do need to teach it. Absolutely. But it is not the end all be all. It's the, yeah, it's like you said, it's a language. I like thinking about it that way. Yeah. Well, it comes from the Bauhaus and it's basically just, you know, vocabulary. And as I tell my students, you know, there's other descriptive words you can also use and you don't feel like you can't use those words because you have to use, you know, these specific words. If you have really good descriptive words, you know, throw them in there. That's just as, as valid as anything else. So um, anything that can pull us away from, I like it or I don't like it, I think is... <laughs> Yeah, that's good. talking about the work is important. So. And I love your point too on how uh, if you're worried your kids are not engaged in the topic that, you know, it's lesson, how you plan your lesson is most of the battle. I think if you, if you have a really good engaging lesson where they're learning and they're interested, then yeah. you don't have as many problems. So yeah. Um, that really is the key to 
uh, to you know any discipline issues in the classroom. I, I truly believe yeah. that. I'm excited about what you're doing, and you have you know interesting things going on. I mean, the only time I really had discipline problems is at the end when they're lighting up. Um, and they're just sitting there for like five minutes and with nothing to do. Well, yeah, I mean, they're going to be, <laughs> they're going to be, answering, you know, um, that's when you, you know, have to introduce your games and all that stuff. But, um, you know, not, with nothing to do and, and bored is uh, just a recipe for, for disaster. So. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. So uh, I think you have given us a lot to think about and I'm actually going to think about going and recreating the art table into uh, a family art table uh, after this. <laughs> so, yeah, I have, how can teachers connect with you online? Um, well, I love Facebook because I'm old and I don't do Snapchat or anything like that. Um, so definitely um, I'm on the play Bay side, uh, the Center for Creative Art Teaching, and of course my website, alonosakelly.com. So we will link to all of those in the show yeah. notes. Love it. And my final question, which is what I ask everybody who comes on the podcast, and that is, which artwork changed your life? Okay, I, I, as as you see, I talk a lot, so I'm going to tell a little story. Um, when my daughter was five years old, we decided to take. I decided to take her to Paris, um, and she was looking all the time at um, the the old Jensen art history book um, at the Mona Lisa, and she was obsessed just obsessed with the Mona Lisa and she just would stare at it. It was almost eerie. You know, she's like, I want to see the Mona Lisa. I want to see the Mona Lisa. So um, I was just so excited to like share this work with her. Right. Cause she was so excited about it. And I think that's, that's really important to get kids excited about work that they're about to see. Right. Um, and we got there, you know, and I'm like ready to go. I'm ready to buy her like every single Mona Lisa thing in the gift shop. You know, I'm like <laughs> Mona Lisa. Um, she gets there and she's like, that's it. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, that's it. And she looks around the room. All of these works around here are like 10 times better than the Mona Lisa and nobody's looking at them. Um, and I think it was a real um, learning moment for me, <laughs> for sure. Um, a few things, probably the importance of kind of owning a work of art that she really felt like she owned it in some way and that she had some um, investment in it that she really wanted to see it. And I think that's important. Um, and also seeing an artwork in person, right, and not just the projection on a screen or in a book, um, you know, changes the way you see it. And there's definitely artworks in the past that have changed my perspective as I saw them in real life. Uh, but that really changed my whole uh, perspective in general on, on parenting and all kinds of things, right? I asked her at, at the end, you want to go to the store and get anything with Mona Lisa? She's like, no, it's dead to me, mommy. No. <laughs> Okay, well, I killed the artwork for her, too, which is the other side of that. But at the same time, it opened her eyes to the fact that there were other beautiful things in the room, and she really looked at the other, the other paintings in the room with a new light. So that was, um, yeah, that was probably one of my most favorite, um, I, I don't know, uh, art, uh, art experiences. <laughs> I love that story. That is so good. Uh, it, it's, it is a bummer that she lost her favorite thing, but, um, yeah. Oh man. I love it. I think most people feel that way when you see the Mona Lisa, uh, nice. it is very underwhelming <laughs> in person. If you can see it through the hordes of people. Exactly. Uh, oh man. Thank you for sharing that. I love that story. Um, yeah, I'm actually not a big Mona Lisa fan, although Mona Lisa is in my logo for my website, so it doesn't make it. <laughs> recognize them. All right. Well, thank you so very much for joining me today. Um, it was it was a pleasure. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks again to Ilona for her amazing insight and work in embracing both the play and the person in our classrooms. Visit her website to see examples of her incredible artwork and be sure to grab a copy of her book whenever it comes out. Check out the show notes at artclasscurator.com slash 28 for links and to learn more about everything we talked about today. Next week, we're talking with Anna Nichols of the blog, Managing the Art Classroom. Her blog was incredibly helpful to me as a teacher, especially when it came to the day-to-day -day teaching tasks like classroom management, student behavior, how to grade, and more. I'm so excited to meet her in person for this podcast. Keep listening to hear a preview of my interview with Anna. The thing that I had the most trouble wrapping my head around was the elementary kids.
they don't want to stop working. They want to continue to, they would stay in there the whole day if they were allowed to. So when it was time to clean up, it's like you don't even, the, your teacher's not even in the room. <laughs> Selective hearing, they don't, they just don't want to stop. So that was my biggest challenge last year, was trying to figure out a way to motivate them to stop working. It was crazy.